Okay, uh, we'll, we'll start with this admit card syndrome. So what exactly are the features of this? Uh, please let me know. As of now, uh, there is no information or update in MB website. So admit cards might be available anytime soon. Just keep a tab on mb.edu.in and also log into your account and see if any link is available over there. So in the homepage of NB, uh, they have mentioned about admit cards for foreign dental graduates exam. So they are live for now. For NEET MDS, I don't think there is any update still. So you need not worry about, uh, see, first of all, admit cards will be given. If not on time, there can be uh, some delay. So they might be working, we exactly don't know. But you will have your admit cards. Don't worry, just keep a tab on mb.edu.in. And once there is any relevant update, we'll also get back to you with an update in our Telegram or Google update group, right? So I hope you guys are all doing good. So very good evening, all of you. So how is everything going on? Again, today's question, the same question. Let's see how you answer. So how are you guys doing? Option A, good. Option B, very good. Option C, very, very good. Option D, awesome. Or any other option you would choose again. So how are you doing? Yes. Okay. So keep answering. I hope you guys are ready for today's session. Today we'll deal with some specific topics from general surgery. Okay. And before I start, I would like to once again let you know or update you regarding revision test, practice test in specific. So we have started this practice test in order to reach more and more aspirants and to give them that benefit of or experience uh, in a final exam format. So if you wish to practice the same 240 MCQs, one fourth negative marking, image-based patients and case-based patients, incorporate in this, you can just get back through mail and we're charging 100 rupees only. Okay, All right. I see most of you are choosing option C. I mean, why not option D? Okay, very good. Rana says is Bindas and rocking. If there were any CAM right now, then it would be even more transparent, isn't it? Very good. Right. So let's start with our presentation. Another place which I, which I would uh, like to share today in today's live session. So if you're planning on vacation after December 16th, you can definitely consider this place. It's an island off coast uh, South Korea, an amazing place. And I'm sure uh, beach lovers especially will be enjoying the same, right? Okay, the climate is very awesome, except in summers where it is, I mean, uh, in India, if you are able to face summers in India, you can face summers in any part of the world without any doubt. So except for summers, the uh, rest of the time, it's, it's an amazing place. Chilly air and lovely scenes all together, right? So I uh, will start with yesterday's case-based question. We have seen Anku's mother uh, suffering from not copper toxicity, as one of you mentioned about copper toxicity, no. So does it mean uh, when you drink something from a steel bottle, uh, do you get steel toxicity? Something from mud, uh, mud container, mud toxicity? I don't think uh, that, that, that would be the equation. So Anku's mother, Auntie weighing 50 kgs is suffering from severe migraine. So unable to tolerate the pain, she took a available strip of 15 paracetamol tablets at once. She reported to hospital 10 hours after ingestion of tablets with symptoms of sweating, trembling, irritability, hypoglycemia due to hypoglycemia and the medical personnel will. Which are the following options would you choose? NAC, as most of you rightly mentioned, is the right answer. So N-acetyl cysteine, very good, well done. So I'm sure Ankur's mother will survive. So paracetamol overdose, first and foremost, paracetamol is widely used OTC or over-the-counter product, the drug or painkiller. And there are specific signs of paracetamol poisoning which include yellowing of skin and whiteness of eyes, jaundice, loss of coordination, and hypoglycemia, which can cause symptoms like sweating, trembling, and irritability. So these are some of the symptoms of paracetamol overdose. So in case of paracetamol overdose, so there is hepatotoxicity, and also occasionally renal failure has been documented. 
So N-acetylcysteine is the uh, preferred antidote, which is given IV or even orally in some countries, which protects against toxicity if given less than eight hours after ingestion. So consider this criteria very, very important. A patient presenting after eight hours after ingestion should have immediate NAC administration, as in case of uncle's uh, mother, auntie, which can later be stopped if the paracetamol level is in treatment line. And if a patient presents more than 15 hours after ingestion, we'll go for liver function test, prothrombin time, INR, renal function test to assess the uh, damage that has happened. And then antidote is started. And then we have to inform poisons information center or liver unit for their advice. Liver transplantation should be considered in individuals who develop acute liver failure due to paracetamol because it has this capacity to destroy or damage liver. If multiple paracetamol injections have been taken place over, over a period of time that is staggered overdose, all the treatment, so, we, so plasma concentration will be unpredictable, but still we can go with this antidote, N-acetyl cysteine, right? Then acetyl cysteine is the choice of uh, the choice or the preferred antidote in case of paracetamol poisoning. Very good. And finally, let me conclude with this. Please make a note. So significant paracetamol overdose usually occurs when it exceeds more than 75 milligrams per kg body weight. Okay. So as uh, given in Davidson, Davidson is the reference for this. So more than 75 milligrams per kg, uh, per kg body weight, paracetamol overdose. Right now, let's let's move on to today's topic, today's subject. Yes, general surgery will deal with the following topics. First, we have the following question: Main modality of treatment in carcinoma, maxillary antrum, especially in advanced cases, chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy, palliative therapy. So, which one do you think is a more appropriate treatment option? initial treatment option or main modality in case of maxillary antrum carcinoma, especially in advanced cases, right? So which of the following options do you think is more appropriate answer? So in the meantime, let's review some information. See, we can go for either maxillectomy, partial maxillectomy, depending upon the location. We can go for radiotherapy, both in combination to address, address the same. So which one do you think is a more appropriate option? So in advanced cases, especially, radiotherapy is the main modality of treatment in carcinoma maxillary antrum. Curative rate is almost 70% in early cases. In advanced cases, however, radiotherapy is given first, which reduces the bulk of tumor so that unresectable lesion becomes resectable and maxillectomy can be done. So in advanced cases, radiotherapy followed by surgery. Surgery can be done in the form of total maxillectomy when the growth involves entire maxilla or it is of high grade, followed by post-operative radiotherapy. It's a combination. Tumors of lower half of antrum are treated by partial maxillectomy. So in advanced cases, main modality of treatment is, I think some of you have chosen, radiotherapy is a more appropriate answer because the objective is to reduce the bulk of the tumor and then make it uh, into a resectable mass so that we can go for surgery. So option C is the right answer. Even if you're wrong, you have nothing to worry about as long as you are learning from each and every moment or any MCQ which you come across. So have that perspective and keep this momentum going. So second question, keep your spirits high. The snail track ulcer and Hutchinson's wart are seen in which of the following stages of syphilis, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. We dealt with this in e-classes as well, oral path and medicine section. So what do you think is a more appropriate answer? So various stages, uh, dental manifestations in specific and different clinical manifestations in respective stages are very, very important. So as you can see, some of the clinical images so syphilitic lesions, palate, tongue, oral cavity. Let's review some information. And what you find now are snail track appearances on palate and then on the ventral aspect, anterior part of tongue as evident in left and right illustrations respectively. 
the tongue is involved especially we're talking about the lesions of tongue syphilitic lesions of tongue is involved in all stages of syphilis primary syphilis primary chancre that can occur in tongue is highly contagious it affects the tip of tongue chancre we're talking about lesions of tongue in specific secondary syphilis it produces white patch in tongue lips and anterior pillars of fossas in tongue these are multiple which coalesce to form snail track ulcers as you can see in the right illustration the ulcers heal with fine tissue paper scar in some cases of syphilitic organisms they produce flat hypertrophied epithelium which is described as condyloma this is called as hutchinson's wart and then tertiary syphilis you know gamma characteristic syphilis also produces chronic superficial glossitis which is characterized by bald tongue with loss of papilla and fissure tongue so which one do you think is more appropriate answer i think some of you have chosen b secondary snail track also and hutchinson's wart are seen in case of secondary syphilis again if you're wrong you have nothing to worry about as long as you're learning from each and every mcq for that matter even the day of exam is and will be or shall be a learning experience i mentioned about quantum sufficient yesterday if you remember right now observe these clinical images carefully and then register them in your mind accordingly it's by observation pure observation undivided attention so third question assertion and reason let's see how many of you are going to answer it right basal cell carcinoma doesn't spread by lymphatics because the size of a tumor emboli in basal cell carcinoma are big so that's the reason why uh, they don't spread by lymphatics as per the question so what do you think are both statements true or are they false and if both are true do you think reason justifies the given assertion or the statement so what do you think is more appropriate answer as you know basal cell carcinoma mainly spreads by local invasion slow growth rodent ulcer so you are very familiar with all these keywords right yeah yes so which one do you think is a more appropriate answer so let's review some information a spread of basal cell carcinoma or bcc it spreads by local invasion even though slow growing it slowly penetrates deep inside destroying the underlying tissues like bone cartilage or even eye ball depending upon the location hence the name rodent ulcer rodents it doesn't spread by lymphatics because the size of tumor and boli are big as you all have rightly mentioned so option b is right answer and blood spread is extremely rare okay some additional points regarding basal cell carcinoma option b is right answer very good well done now let's move on to the next question i'm sure you're going to answer it right or maybe not let's see rule of valles rule of nine is related to assessing which are the following acid base balance in the patient extent of burns oxygen saturation dehydration so which one do you think is a more appropriate answer rule of valles rule of nine so what's this all about what is this related to so try answering this in the meantime let's review some information you did not in my opinion you do not memorize this percentage just by pure observation and visualization uh, previously in one of the discussions if you remember i mentioned about tachycardia and bradycardia the speed limits assume that you're driving and you're seeing some speed limits so visualization greatly helps even though it's not that you need to cook up a story every time to remember but even by pure observation as i said with undivided attention you can exactly reproduce this image in your uh, mind just by closing your eyelids after thorough observation so observe this image let's review some information so assessment of extent of burns in terms of bsa or body surface area so it is calculated by rule of nine rule of valles so you know we have various percentages so in case of burns of head and neck 9% anterior fore and of posterior so total 9% as you can see dorsal and ventral surfaces as evident in this illustration so burns of head and neck 9% burns of upper limb 9 into 2 18% burns of anterior trunk 9 9 posterior trunk the same 9 18% and burns of lower limbs 9999 so 18 into 2 36% 
that is front and back of each limb is 9% as evident here and burns of external genitalia 1%, right? So assessment of extent of burns in terms of body surface area is rule of nines or rule of values, right? So option B, I think all of you have chosen only one option, excellent. Option B is right answer. Now let's move on to the next question. So time taking, a lengthy question. Let's see how many of you are going to answer it right. From the scheme given below, choose the appropriate order of priorities in management of patient with polytrauma. You have the following uh, components in question, control of external hemorrhage, intravenous infusion, transfusion, maintenance of patent airway. I'm sorry for the spelling mistake of maintenance. Relief of tension pneumothorax, splinting of fracture. So what would be a more appropriate life-saving protocol in case of polytrauma? So Bailey and Love will be reviewing some information from Bailey and Love in the meantime. Yes, you can keep answering. I hope uh, you follow, which book do you follow for general surgery? Right. So there are some elements of primary survey. So primary survey, in fact, primary survey aims to identify and manage the most immediately life-threatening pathologies first and follows C, A, B, C, D, E protocol. So previously it was A, B, C, D, E, but now uh, it's C, A, B, C, D, E in the latest edition. If you observe, uh, have you seen, I mean, you might have seen several Hollywood, Bollywood or any uh, movies or web series for that matter. Immediately when there is gunshot injury or any major wound in case in, in wars, in fights, etc. The first thing you see the characters doing is tying up the wound, tonic weights and trying to stop bleeding. So bleeding, uh, arresting bleeding, uh, major bleeding seems to be uh, the top priority. So this is based on these concepts. So control of massive external hemorrhage. I mean, why see? I'll review some information which is interesting. So exsanguinating external hemorrhage. Experience from war zones over the past 20 years has shown that exsanguinating external hemorrhage from massive arterial bleeding needs to be controlled even before the airway is managed. Most of these injuries are due to gunshot wounds or blasts and are mainly seen in military practice. However, they are encountered in civilian practice. Bleeding must be controlled immediately by application of packs and pressure directly onto bleeding, wound, and artery. Hemostatic dressings that contain agents that augment local coagulation are now available. Failure to control bleeding in the limb by direct pressure should be followed by application of tonic weight proximal to the wound. In the field, simple tonic weights can be improvised if pneumatic tonic weights are not available. It's vital to appreciate that once tonic weight is applied, the limb becomes ischemic. The time for which tonic weight is applied must be recorded of the patient and patient requires urgent surgical control of bleeding in order to reperfuse the limb. In fact, I've seen one of the movies, uh, they're going for cot -free. So, Control of massive external hemorrhage to be a top priority uh, even before airway management right and then you have a b c d e a airway management b breathing and ventilation c circulation and hemorrhage control d dysfunction of cns e exposure in a controlled environment okay uh, do remember this sequence and consider this very very important so as you mentioned about the sequence b is a right one so three four one two five so, in fact, one can come even um, before uh, three, uh, based on what we have seen just now, right? So, since there is no one, three, four, two, five, we can go for three, four, one, two, five, the more appropriate answer. I hope it's clear. So, maintenance of patent airway, followed by release of tension, uh, tension pneumothorax, and then control of external hemorrhage, intravenous infusion, transfusion, and then splinting of fractures, okay? Last resort, last modality in the protocol. Very good. I think most of you have chosen a B. I think based on ABCD rule, fantastic, fantastic. But keep this in mind, control of massive external hemorrhage, small letter C. If at all there is a question on sequence. So let's conclude with this case based question. A person, a person comes with a complaint of discolored raised lesion on his chest as shown in the picture with no pain. In fact, I have removed that picture uh, because that's conclusive. 
anyways i'll share this picture in tomorrow's revision class so uh, i've given you the anatomic side right on chest so he has history of trauma and wound at which at that which has left for a spontaneous bleeding pathological examination showed hypertrophy of mature fibroblasts what could be the condition so keloid fistula sinus hypertrophic scar go through this question at least twice before you jump into giving answers okay it could be a soup trap i'm sure you'll do good right so we'll we'll start with this question tomorrow and we'll see uh, in fact we covered all the subjects uh, at least once so this will be general surgery i think final so i think we still have dental anatomy or histology uh, to go through so we'll deal with them as well right so well done everyone so just keep this enthusiasm going is it keloid so i said it could be a soup trap isn't it okay okay guys so Uh, very well done and appreciate your enthusiasm and active participation just keep this momentum going right and you need any further assistance you need any further clarification you can get back to me at proudtobedentist@gmail.com 24 by 7 exams might be approaching exams there can be several exams in life but it shouldn't worry you at all because any exam is an opportunity for you to progress in your respective professional including personal life including personal life so consider this as an opportunity so as the day of opportunity is coming closer it should be obvious that you're feeling excited or enthused but if it is other way around it's only because of the way in which you are looking at these exams it's not a punishment it's not for the, it's not being conducted so that you would prove someone something it's all about our our individual progress ultimately at the end of the day so consider this as an opportunity and each and every moment is a learning experience including the day of final exam right so wish you all the best love you all i'll see you again tomorrow in another quick revision class take care yeah admit card will I'll, i'll let you know if there is any update that will be So just keep a tab on and be dot edu dot in. It will be any time uh, soon. Yeah. Yeah. Mother will thank you, Nature, for asking about mother. I appreciate your concern. Mother will be fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys. Take care. Ta da. -da.